Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Suniva O'Flynn, and I look after Irish film programming in the Irish Film Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome you to part three of Spotlight 2020. Uh, some of you may have engaged with our earlier sessions where we have migrated um, Spotlight to uh, this digital platform. And um, Spotlight is the IFI's annual moment where we uh, take a day to reflect on what has gone before in the past 12 months in Irish film and television, uh, and to look at particular uh, elements of the film and television industry that may be uh, of interest to our audiences, who include industry members, um, filmmakers, academics, and members of the general public. Uh, we feel very strongly that uh, the development of a critical film culture is essential for uh, the evolution of that culture. It's important for filmmakers uh, and critics and academics to understand uh, what has gone before and to be involved with us in discussions uh, of you know, how the industry, what, what is the state of uh, play with the industry today. Uh, we have over the past number of years, the past eight years in fact, uh, looked at a number of uh, aspects of Irish film and television from co-production to animation, experimentation, gender. Uh, we have had uh, particular profiles of filmmakers and uh, industry uh, workers of one kind and another. Um, Today, uh, we're very pleased in part three of Spotlight 2020 to be taking a moment to consider representations of race in Irish cinema. And we're very honoured today to be joined by Dr. Zaley Asava, um, who has been with us before. Um, Zaley Asava, she is an independent scholar and film classifier. She is the author of Mixed Race Cinemas, Multiracial Dynamics in America and France. Uh, that was published in 2017. Before that, she published The Black Irish On Screen, representing black and mixed race identities on Irish film and television. She has taught extensively at University College Dublin and Dundalk Institute of Technology, where she was program director of the degrees in film production and creative multimedia, as well as at Trinity College Dublin and IADT. Prior to entering academia, she worked as an MP's casework manager at the House of Commons as a diversity and inclusion consultant for local government and as a freelance journalist. Um, she has presented at Spotlight before. Some of you may, may remember that she spoke in advance of a film called Where My Ladies, uh, a really interesting film made by her students in Dundalk Institute of Technology. And in 2016, uh, she spoke about uh, her students' work and her students reflecting uh, the difficulties experienced by women in the Irish film industry. But she's, today she's here to talk to us uh, about race and to talk about this current moment where we are on the precipice of, of new awareness, new understandings, um, and we're all involved uh, in uh, conscientizing and, and developing our uh, awareness of race identity and, and uh, community identity. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Zaley Asava to speak to us uh, about her findings. Thank you, Zaley. Thank you, Suniva. Uh, and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to address racial representations as part of Spotlight, um, particularly at a time when we're coming to terms with the extent of racial inequality in our society and, of course, around the world. Um, while mass immigration is a phenomenon relatively new to Ireland, the country has been, as John Brannigan notes, uh, has always been, heterogeneous and hybrid, and in the last century became home to significant numbers of Polish, Romanian, Indian, Nigerian, Latvian, Filipino, Brazilian, and Chinese people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. And you can see some of the, the diversity of our film culture on screen there. Martin McLuhan describes Irishness as, quote, a shifting set of signifiers that inhabit a space between the local and the global, an ethnic and national identity that occupies a liminal space that reflects Ireland's specific relationship to the global and the universal. Today, I'd like to focus on the representation of black and mixed race people on screen, a group largely represented as African and occasionally, <clears throat> excuse me, and occasionally as American in Irish cinema, despite the presence of a large black population in Europe for several hundred years, and despite the success of homegrown talent, including our very own Ruth Negger, who of course was nominated for an Oscar in 2017. 
2016 data from the Central Statistics Office shows that the mixed race grouping is in fact the fastest growing ethnic group in Ireland, as it is in much of the West. The latest census data also shows that nearly half of all black people born here, um, living here, sorry, were born here. Yet in screen culture, as in the socio-political arena, Ireland remains represented through a series of tropes which often exclude its non-white citizens and present them as foreign as other. Hence the black Irish on screen are largely framed as um, newcomers to our uh, shores rather than as locals, as one of them rather than as one of us. This may seem abstract, but it has real consequences for many people with um, many black Irish people suffering daily microaggressions, covert as well as overt racism and other non-white Irish people, including our own Lord Mayor, Dublin's Lord Mayor and our Tornister, not infrequently being referred to as migrants due to the idea that Irishness can only ever be white. There is much that media can do to shift these false representations, with last week's Irish Time supplement being a significant step forward in recognising not only the presence, but also the vast talent and contributions of the Black Irish community. As, Ireland, as Irish cinema found its voice in the 80s and 90s, Black characters were often used as a method of referencing our relationship with Britain and the historic exclusion of Irishness from the empire's concept of whiteness. In The Crying Game, for example, black and mixed race characters are paired with the white Irish male lead in a semiotic mirroring that visually conveys the exclusion and alienation felt by the protagonist, who is thus constructed as liminal and oppressed. In The Crying Game, Irish identity and its relationship with Britain is explored through the prism of the mixed race gender ambiguous Dill, who enables Fergus to shed his presumed whiteliness and be reimagined as victim, highlighting his historical off-white status as a subject of the British Empire. This is exemplified in the first scene set in London, where Fergus is seen on a building site covered in white construction dust, which acts as a form of racial masking, enabling him to pass for white, pass for straight, pass for a builder, rather than a terrorist. The visual lines of the scaffolding enhance his physical separation from the presumably upper-class white English men playing cricket on the green below. His ethnic otherness is later reinforced by his intimate in identification with Jodie and Dill, black and mixed race characters who mirror this lack. In a dream sequence, he imagines Caribbean born Jodie, who had to give up playing his much loved cricket in Britain due to racism, bowling happily in the same brilliant whites. Yet this collapsing of imperial narratives as seen also in the commitments where a white man declares that the Irish are the blacks of Europe and thus have a natural affinity for the blues before stating I'm black and I'm proud, ignores the existence of the Black Irish and their experiences of discrimination at home, just as it whitewashes over Irish participation in empire and of course, the institutionalization of mixed race children in this country, where they were subject to specifically racialized forms of abuse and continue to be denied access to family records. As has been well documented, the Celtic Tiger heralded the greatest social changes since the birth of the state, as Ireland entered into a decade of prosperity which saw its national demographic diversify and expand. Ruth Barton noted that the only thing culturally specific about most Irish films at this time was their lack of cultural specificity. And in 2007, Pavel Barta referred to an explosion in Irish horror films, quote, from Stephen Bradley's Boy Eats Girl to Billy O'Brien's Isolation, Indigenous cinema has a newfound appetite to shock. Isolation and Boy Eats Girl both feature mixed race female protagonists, Mary, played by Irish Ethiopian actress Reed Negger, and Jessica, played by Irish Zambian actress Samantha Mamba. The horror film plays on the terror of the unimaginable, on revulsion, fears, insecurities, and uncertainties, yet it is also yet it also often challenges the dominant ideologies of the hegemony. For example, in both Isolation and Boyd's Girl, the mixed race figure is irrefutably Irish and responsible for saving the nation. In Boyd's Girl, a budding romance between middle-class teenagers Jessica and Nathan is disturbed by a zombie attack. Nathan fears that Jessica has stopped loving him and so commits suicide. His mother uses voodoo to bring him back from the dead and as he feeds, he produces a zombie army. Rural realist horror Isolation's protagonists are also a young couple. Mary and Jamie run away together after her family reject him. He's a traveler and occupies a lower status here than non-whites. In Isolation and Boy Eats Girl, the mixed race character is the instigator of the disorder, which leads to the ultimate horror, and yet is also the only character with the hybrid cultural competence to restore order. 
So in both films, uh, they are the final girl. Uh, the mixed race character is the one who continues um, and, and survives and prospers at the end of the film. But in isolation in particular, this issue of amalgamation that's often treated as being at the heart of fear is about racial mixing um, and these racist science stereotypes that go back to the idea of races as different species is dealt with through her becoming pregnant with a child which is in part alien. Both films play on cultural and cinematic stereotypes, highlighting the perceived tragedy, transgressiveness and monstrosity of the mixed race body, together with its perceived exotic beauty, futurity and potential for transracial mediation. While contemporary Irish cinema has moved away from the historic focus on the faults of the church, government and family, as seen as its most commercially successful in the work of Neil Jordan and Jim Sheridan, there remains an implicit critique of Irish institutions and divisions in more recent successes, such as What Richard Did and The Guard, which go further by focusing on critiques of class, ethnicity and personal responsibility. In The Guard, a crime drama which following buddy moving conventions pairs a black and a white cop from opposite sides of the tracks, Gleason's protagonist uses performance as a theatre of resistance, employing the grotesque to demythologize and deconstruct fictions. The eccentric guard from Connemara is paired with a serious and sophisticated FBI agent in a bid to catch international drug traffickers. In their first scene together, FBI agent Everett is delivering a speech to the force when Boyle interrupts him to ask how the criminals they're looking for can all be white and mostly Irish. Quote, I thought only black lads were drug dealers and Mexicans. When heckled by other officers, all white Irish men, he defends his outlook. Quote, I'm Irish, racism's part of my culture. While farcical, his statements belie certain truths, just as race is a cultural construct, so racism is a cultural product. Lucy Michael's 2015 report on Afrophobia in Ireland notes that discriminatory behaviour towards people of African descent is frequently ignored or denied because it is so embedded in our culture. As Brian Fanning argues, there is, quote, an ongoing legacy of racism and paternalism rooted in the collective Irish imagination which impacts upon black people in Irish society. A Gallup survey for the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights found that 73% of black Africans in Ireland believed ethnic discrimination was widespread. The film is of course rooted in postmodern irony, polysemy and intertextuality, as well as being full of cues not to take the text seriously. But its comedy masks some uncomfortable truths about discrimination in the superficially harmonious small community depicted, among them, racism, homophobia, sexism, snobbery, and sectarianism. Through its adoption of the surreal, the guard reveals many aspects of the unsaid in Irish popular culture, interrogating representations of the estranged of Ireland's past, present, and future. And as in Jordan's work, it uses the black agent to highlight the otherness of its hero. Celtic Tiger film and television was celebrated for its diversity and yet generally isolated or absented blackness in its representations, for example, by placing the mixed race character in an exclusively white family in an exclusively white space, as in love hate or love is the drug, or by positioning the black character beyond any connection to the black community, as in prosperity or fair city. While integration on screen is positive, it is important to critique model minor minoritarian, colorblind and isolationist narratives which may exploit non-white characters to capitalize on popular culture's fascination with black and multiracial culture, a fascination which dates back to the period when interracial unions were illicit and the desire to explore this taboo shaped the earliest American films. For example, as Stephanie Raines observes of 1998's The Nevew, which follows the journey of a mixed race Irish American back to his mother's village, quote, having placed race at the start, at the center of its story, The Nevew then appears to go to great lengths to avoid facing the contradiction inherent in its own subject matter. The few scenes in which Chad's race are mentioned are truncated, and the dialogue seems unconvincingly styled so as to discount this issue as a factor in plot developments. And as Ging noted at the peak of the Celtic Tiger, quote, in the current climate in which a postmodern aesthetic of surface representation dominates, social marginalization, multiculturalism and homosexuality are in danger of being posited as ready formed subcultures with visual appeal, rather than as complex social situations with which policymakers are still coming to grips. 
More recent films tend to evade ethnic diversity altogether or feature a black character in just one scene with or without lines, as in A Date for Mad Mary, Out of Here and What Richard Did. In his review of 2018's raver drama Dublin Old School, Donald Clark observed that, quote, people of colour are conspicuous by their near complete absence. No minor feat, given that it's set in Dublin city centre. Yet, despite the nostalgia for homogeneity exhibited during the last recession, where like Amelie's whitewashed Paris, Dublin and other major cities were racially reimagined, more and more filmmakers are now opening up spaces for a national identity based on cultural bonds as well as blood ties, enabling Irishness to encompass a multi-ethnic populace. 2018's Rosie is a familiar Ruddy Doyle snapshot of working class Dublin, now comfortably interracial and intercultural. 2019's Hellboy presents a mixed race woman of Irish descent as one of its leads. And in the 2013 Irish language documentary Ashling Gyal, the rich richness of our cultural heritage is seen through the eyes of Shahira Apraku, a young mixed race pupil of Shano Song in Cork's Muskri Gaeltacht. The film is a fly on the wall documentary intercut with stylized meditative shots of the Sullane River ebbing and flowing. While adding a poetic dimension, these shots evoke the various physical shifts which the country has seen as embodied by Shahira's German, Zambian, Irish family and emphasize her metaphoric role as a transnational cross-cultural communicator. <clears throat> Paula Keogh's 2013 Irish language film Ndova Nigel, Assimilation, a documentary on the Irish Aborigines of Australia, reveals a mixed diasporic history directed by a member of the New Irish, albeit someone with Irish heritage, and presented by Louis Depore, a one-time immigrant in Australia. It features interludes of Depore's poetry, Osgeelga, scored by traditional Aboriginal music, thus suturing the two native cultures. Keogh states, quote, the fact that the poems were written in Irish is crucial. English is the language of the colonizer for both the Irish and Aboriginal people, and certainly the Aboriginal people I spoke to have a very keen awareness of those parallels. So by moving away from an English narrative, Keogh was able to move away from imperial hierarchies and to facilitate the telling of stories which move beyond simple racial binaries. This opens up space for new readings of diasporic narratives. If the Irish state has always been heterogeneous and hybrid, then surely the, the diaspora must also be read within this context. Yet few productions visualize this reality. If we look at Irish American film and TV shows, for example, 1993's Queen and 1998's The Nevew are a few of the rare examples where the Irish diaspora is presented as black or brown. Yet as early as 1976, RTE screened a documentary called The Black Irish about the population of Caribbean island Montserrat, a place where Irish men arrived as both indentured servants and as slave owners and the only country apart from Ireland where St. Patrick's Day is a national holiday. In Ken Wardrop's 2017 documentary, Making the Grade, an outstanding young pianist from Derry is given center stage for her artistic talent rather than her race. The film is Wardrop's first to include minority ethnic Irish and foreign individuals and suggests a new acceptance of these figures as part of the cultural landscape of modern Ireland. Mary McGuckian's A Girl from Mogadishu is another positive example of collaborative Irish and minority ethnic storytelling, where being African American is paralleled with being African Irish, and the transformative nature of identity is centralized. The film details Ifra Ahmed's journey from war refugee to Irish citizen and internationally recognized anti FGM campaigner, and due to her involvement, presents the country through a very different lens to most films dealing with asylum seekers. In doing so, the film humanizes and normalizes diversity in Ireland. When examining the popularization of images of contemporary Ireland as cosmopolitan and multicultural, it is important to consider Debbie King's critical question. Do these films merely, quote, give disenfranchised and disempowered groups image space, as opposed to a genuinely empowered voice? Mixed race and black characters have featured in many Irish films, particularly since the greater influx of migrants in the 90s, but they're still often cast as lone troublesome stereotypes, prostitutes, single mothers, drug dealers, pimps, illegal migrants, and so on. The non-white poly polyglot is often positioned as vulnerable and dependent, following on from Hollywood stereotypes of the tragic mulatto or the disenfranchised refugee. 
And while 2017 films Cardboard Gangsters, Kissing Candice, Michael Inside and Halal Daddy all feature black and mixed race characters who are Irish rather than foreign, they are also mostly criminal and despite having a lot of screen time, mostly marginal to the main narrative. Non-white children remain rare in Irish features or television and where present, their sense of exclusion is often centralized. A 2018 report by the European Broadcasters Union commissioned by RTE stated that RTE was out of touch with its audience and lacked a discernible plan for diversity. Later that year, RTE published its diversity and inclusion charter outlining the organization's commitment to change. And 2018 saw Irish television produce a variety of popular multicultural fare, largely led by women, with sitcoms Women on the Verge and Finding Joy presenting racially integrated casts of alienated middle-class Dubliners, the 90s set comedy Derry Girls diversifying its cast to include a non-white Irish character, Cork's The Young Offenders featuring a black Irish lead, as well as transracial adoption and interracial love, and the Dublin set drama Taken Down, looking at the complex issues deriving from the direct provision system for those seeking asylum in Ireland. Using an intersectional approach, Taken Down explores how white and black women experience gender bias differently. More specifically, it explores how gender bias affects middle class and working class women differently, and how this intersects with racism to affect trafficked women and asylum seekers. Taken Down is one of few Irish productions to focus on the lived experience of racism. And given its large initial viewing figures, driven by the team's previous success with Love Hate, stimulated debate on the prevalence of the problem. Centered on the police investigation of an asylum seeker found murdered near a direct provision center in Dublin, the crime drama's narrative pivots on the relationship between female detectives and asylum seekers. The series relies on stereotypes to expose the inequities caused by racial binaries, yet it is novel in revealing race and nationality to be constructs. By centralizing the narratives of children growing up in direct provision, questions are raised about those who must navigate being black Irish, yet having no legal claim to Irishness, those who live in liminal, a liminal space between refuge and deportation, being both homeless and stateless. As it shifts from police procedural to a more sensational narrative centered on a brothel, a business predominantly catering to white men's interest in black Africans, Taken Down reverts to a familiar binary, that of the nation state versus over-sexualized foreigners. As DJ Shandy notes, quote, immigration debates were literally and figuratively inscribed on African immigrant women's bodies. African women and especially their children represented a sort of malignancy in the body politic which resulted in African mothers being publicly demonized and subjected to verbal and physical assaults. And according to Ronit Lenton, quote, non-national women were made central to the racial configuration of 21st century Ireland, illustrating not only orchestrated moral panics about floods of refugees, but also the positioning of sexually active women as a danger to the state and the nation. Uh, in part, it was the, the um, media a certain degree of hysteria and fear regarding these women that led to the Citizenship Act of 2005 to prevent people from benefiting from so-called um, pregnancy tourism. It could be argued that while Ireland has become much more multicultural, as evidenced by the well-publicized citizenship ceremonies, it has not yet embraced hybrid hyphenated identities because of this very act, which denies people born or raised in Ireland, like the protagonist's sons, the automatic legal right to be Irish. Uh, coming back to film, in the 2017 short film Cry Rosa by Afro Mike Productions, Rosa juggles the difficulties of growing up during the troubles in 1980s Belfast with being mixed race. In an all too common narrative, Rosa is read by her peers as African, bullied and excluded. Inspired by the producer's own experiences, it is one of few Irish films to be led by a mixed race person, both on and off screen. And by engaging with inequality on a personal level, it visualizes the significant impact of racism on one's quality of life, as noted in the memoirs of various well-known Irish mixed race people, from Tim Brannigan and Paul McGrath to Elizabeth Anyonwu and Emma Dabery. As Geraldine Meany observes, quote, racism was never a marginal factor in Irish society, nor a specific historical response to the numbers of actual migrants arriving in the late 1990s. In Bonnie Dempsey's short film, The Girl at the End of the Garden, a black girl claims to be 
an alien with magical powers and amazes her new white friend with the potential of her powers. The magical Negro surface narrative intensifies the underlying themes of injustice and inequality at the heart of the direct provision system. The short film features an all-female cast and utilizes fantasy themes to highlight the surreal otherworldliness of such an oppressive system in a free society hiding in plain sight. And in All in Good Time, or also by Dempsey, the question of Irishness is broadened through a narrative of communication between the inhabitants of a traditional rural cottage, connecting the past to the present through a time travel friendship between a mixed girl and a white boy. As in the 2020 Belfast set TV show, My Left Nut, the mixed race girls in these dramas are interesting, outspoken, fun and adventurous. Their confidence a welcome shift from the screen stereotype of the tragic mulatta. And where Irish, they are positioned as part of the wider community rather than as outcasts. Still, the contemporary mixed race Irish character often symbolizes lawlessness, the breakdown of the normative family unit, social fractures, alienation and so on as personified by Ryan Lincoln's characters in Cardboard Gangsters and Kissing Candace. While the racial angle is never mentioned in Kissing Candace, it is hard to overlook given its rarity in Irish cinema and given that the ending, while genre specific, conforms to anti-miscegenation narratives which posit interracial love as doomed. There are also elements of the magical Negro stereotype here as Jacob takes on an otherworldly quality for Candace, making endless sacrifices for her. Yet unlike most stereotypical narratives, Jacob is given a three-dimensional character and often pictured without the protagonist. We see him with his family in quiet moments alone, under threat and with his friends. Both characters are flawed, damaged and lonely. Both yearn for a real connection with another person and both long to escape the violence of their border town and return to a space of innocence. Initially, this is facilitated by drugs and music in teenage bedrooms then in pastoral spaces where they can bathe in the open and sleep under the stars. Once the final car chase results in a shared loss of consciousness, they are finally able, the film takes on a dreamlike quality with, as they are finally able to realize Candace's initial dream and share a romantic kiss. The director Aoife McArdle has cited German expressionism and the work of Francis Bacon as influences on her work. And the film is carefully constructed to create a distorted landscape against which love can only ever be tragic. Its interracial coupling only enhances the impossibility of a happy ending. Catherine Squires writes, we must realize that we haven't fully grappled with the legacy of de jour, let alone de facto racism and cannot allow post-racial optimism to blind us to the corrosive effects of race in the contemporary world. Ireland still has a significant problem with racism, as noted by public figures, such as the RTE broadcaster Zainab Bolladale, and in reports to the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination last year, by agencies such as the Association of Mixed Race Irish, ENAR Ireland, and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Despite some attempts to address structural inequalities, independent bodies such as the ICI believe that the state remains underprepared for the demands that come with a more diverse population. Northern Ireland faces its own problems with Belfast long known as the hate crime capital of Europe. The film industry is addressing issues of inequality here with key changes introduced to section 481 last year, the Irish tax incentive for the creative media industries, which now requires all productions to provide details on gender equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives and plans for sustainability. In illuminating and challenging post-race discourse, film and television productions centered on diversity have the possibility to enable new voices um, to amplify uh, black voices to enrich and expand our understanding of Irishness as well as combating racial prejudice and misrecognition. However there is still a tendency for filmmakers and showrunners to focus on race characters as the subject of tragic narratives as well as to centralize mixed race rather than black or Asian characters suggesting a degree of colorism and to represent racial integration as sexual. And while it has been great to see so many female-led films and television programs in recent years, and certainly that shows that when there's a commitment to change, things can, th can happen very quickly in the industry. There has been a regression to all white casts in many film productions, which can feed into anti-migrant, anti-black sentiment. We will only get away from thinking of homogeneity as natural and normal if we start to see heterogeneous, diverse agents and environments normalized on screen. 
that is representations that reflect the cities and towns and villages that we live in. We do, for example, have an, an indigenous black Irish community, a mixed race Irish community, which should be represented on screen. And we have ethnically diverse uh, spaces across the country. This is not only a public health issue, a social justice issue, or something we should do out of charitable generosity. Screening diversity is also a potential source of major growth for the industry, as what, there is widespread evidence that diverse content yields greater box office success and higher ratings, both nationally and internationally. Finally, it's important to understand or to, to remember that the industry will only grow effectively with the participation of all. Stories featuring characters who are black or disabled, gay or female are not limited in terms of their appeal. They're fundamentally human stories with which we can all identify. So we need to start seeing diversity as part of who we are rather than as something separate and bring more of that reality to the screen. The National Snapshot broadcast just a few months ago, um, May Day, 24 hours in Ireland's lockdown, did just that by showing the impact of the pandemic. Um, from the taxi drivers ferrying around essential workers to the lorry drivers working non-stop to maintain food supplies. While it didn't address the disproportionate effect of the virus on black and Asian communities, it did highlight the diversity of our um, workforce and particularly our healthcare workers. While it's important to see a variety of creative productions allowing artists free license to present their personal visions on screen, we must be wary of reducing our minority communities to a single narrative or indeed ignoring them entirely. Through media which aims to capture the reality of our brilliant and broad differences rather than nostalgia for an imagined past and through media which focuses on our common bonds, Ireland's ethnic minorities may be brought from the margins to the centre to give voice to the hidden multiplicities of our polyglot multicultural nation. I hope that we will see more of the world we live in reflected on screen, particularly so that our young people will see themselves reflected and recognized and valued as equal and um, active members of our society and perhaps even contributors to the ongoing work of redefining and reshaping our vibrant visual, visual culture. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Zeli, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's invaluable to have that overview of uh, representations of race in Irish cinema in recent decades. Uh, certainly there have been images, you know, as, as, as the representation evolved, uh, some of the earlier representations would kind of slip through uh, without our noticing, but, but for you to chart uh, the evolution of, you know, those portraits is invaluable so that we're empowered so that we have a sense of what that history is and so that we're um, mindful and you know familiar with the tropes and stereotypes uh, so that you know we can be aware of that and, and probably challenge that um, as audience members. Um, Zeli, I, I'm kind of interested in the Irish situation. Um, I know your focus has been kind of primarily 80s and beyond. Uh, necessarily because there would have been so few appearances um, of black people in, in Ireland and in Irish cinema prior to that. But I wonder, are there other cultures we can look to? Are there other territories where um, both, you know, where there would be a longer history of um, uh, black presence in the society and thus representation, but also maybe newer cultures where the experience is similar to Ireland, where uh, a society has changed dramatically over a relatively new and short period um, where there, there is an evolving culture that perhaps is more satisfactory than what we've seen here? Um, I think, uh, certainly in terms of your first point, I think that England obviously provides a useful um, model. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from British film culture. Um, in terms of addressing these problems and challenging those stereotypes and tropes. And obviously a lot of mistakes have been made, um, which we can avoid uh, by looking at the more recent work that's coming out. The BFI has just, um, uh, with the London School of Economics, has just released uh, an analysis of race and ethnicity data in the UK film industry. And they've been looking at 
uh, diversity standards that were introduced by the BFI, um, by the British Film Institute in 2016 and have been adopted by Film4 and by BBC uh, Films and how, what impact those um, attempts to address racial inequality in the sector, particularly in terms of um, the hiring of film crews and TV crews, as well as obviously representation on screen. Um, so I think, you know, that there's, a, there's so much that we can learn from uh, countries that have been grappling with these issues for a lot longer, countries that have had sizable ethnic minority populations for a lot longer, and, and policies and laws in place for a lot longer than us. Um, in terms of, of countries that are, that are facing uh, significant change over, over a very short period, it's hard to think of of really anywhere <laughs> because uh, I mean Steve Garner and others have Pierce McHenry uh, in particular noted that he in his opinion Ireland uh, during the Celtic Tiger was experiencing change unlike any other country in Europe um, and I think that our physical distance has uh, has meant that you know it, despite having uh, centuries of busy ports and and um, international exchange um, and despite being a very prominent uh, element of the uh, British Empire uh, in, in that sense, we don't have the physical history of um, black people, Asian people and so on being rooted here for hundreds of years, which would be the case with the continent and with Britain. Um, so I think that uh, our, our situation is reasonably unique um, in many ways, I suppose, um, because of because of our geographical positioning. But we do have this uh, international culture. I mean, um, every pretty much every family has a, a history of migration and connection with other countries. And um, we have always had a large influx of people from other countries as well. So, I mean, even if we look at the past hundred years, um, we have had sizable populations coming, it, coming into Ireland of, of Black and Asian uh, people, but uh, not necessarily staying here. There's been a certain transience. The mixed race Irish people who were born here in the 40s, 50s, 60s, largely left because of racism. Um, but I think that right now we have the opportunity to uh, particularly with the, in, in this current moment, to really face into some of the um, embedded uh, elements of discrimination, of, of bias, of privilege, of, um, uh, you know, we have the opportunity to, to look at these problems in our own society and address structural inequality and to benefit from the discourse, from the conversations that are happening both in terms of the industry and in terms of our society. And I think that there's a lot that we can um, learn from the material that's coming out um, mm -hmm. around the world in terms of that, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, certainly recent Irish responses to the Black Lives Matter movement and, and people protesting um, certainly creates a greater visibility of black communities in Ireland, which I think is invaluable. And, you know, to think about ways of activating that energy um, can be useful. Um, I, I'm thinking about young filmmakers and the cultivation of a film culture, um, which becomes increasingly possible uh, with new technologies and so on. Um, I, I just wonder in, in your experience in, in looking at other cultures, are there patterns of evolution of that culture? Um, you know, is there necessarily collectivization of filmmakers? You know, when you look to black cinema in America in the 1960s, you know, where, where collectives are formed and also in the UK, is there value in that? Um, you know, is that a possibility? Is that something that we should be encouraging? Um, or how, how do we support the development of a, a, a young film culture among kind of black filmmakers in Ireland? I think, um, well, the, the first thing is to, um, in, I suppose, address the issue of education um, at the level of 
studying film courses, uh, what what is the how much ethnic diversity is, is present at that level and what opportunities are being presented to people and and um, how open do they feel the industry is to them. So I think that it begins with trying to reach out to young people uh, at the school level and trying to, um, I suppose, as you say, recognition is such an important part of this, that if people feel that they are included in a certain culture, they're more, they feel more empowered to try to contribute to that culture. Um, so I think uh, we do have a, a certain, I know from my own experience, we do have uh, a reasonable uh, level of ethnic diversity in terms of um, university courses and IT courses and so on. Um, but I think there's more that we could do there. Um, and then shadowing and mentoring opportunities um, are on set to enable people to gain a certain degree of experience. Um, I think that it's important to recognize that so uh, a lot of uh, elements of uh, hiring culture can be informal, can be based on networks, and that there's more that we could do to uh, reach out and to try and level the playing field uh, uh, in terms of hiring. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, in terms of whether people want to set up um, supportive networks which would work alongside that alongside the mainstream film culture um that's really up to those individuals themselves it, it has proven to be as you mentioned very uh beneficial to uh, filmmakers and artists in in the uk and france and america um and i think that filmmakers who have a shared vision are often drawn to one another regardless of race um, so having people who are at the same level, who are working towards um, capturing certain themes and aesthetics on film will obviously benefit the whole. Um, but I think that, you know, it begins with education opportunities and employment opportunities and that those are, those are reasonably um, straightforward things that we can address to begin with. Yeah. Can I, before I draw on questions from our audience, um, I'm just interested in documentary and drama. And, you know, I'm very pleased that, you, you know, you talk about various film forms from shorts to documentary to drama. Um, and, you know, it, do you feel that documentary communicates the truth of a Black experience more effectively? Um, or is the access to documentary production um, more possible for, for people entering the film industry than, than, than you know, full-blown features? Um, I'm rambling a little, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, there's such a very different um, offers from documentary and, and drama. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that in some ways this comes down to writers being inspired to, to, to a great extent by their own experience of the world and perhaps being reluctant to include um, non-white characters in drama if they themselves don't have experiences that they feel would lead to an authentic voice for that character. I think there's also a fear with drama that the race will become a prominent aspect of the production if they include somebody who is non-white and that that becomes a theme that has to be addressed. Um, so I think that in terms of drama, that's part of the reason why we tend to get these quite uh, often quite limited representations whereby, um, you know, the, the, there is a certain tragedy uh, associated with, with the non-white character on screen. Um, I think that there's a lot that can be done to broaden the, those representations, um, to go beyond tokenism, to go beyond stereotyping, and to have um, more diverse stories represented on screen. Um, and I think that, that in part, that is that is about making those teams more diverse, teams behind those works. Documentary obviously seems more straightforward because you automatically have uh, then an ethnic minority individual with whom you're collaborating. And so the, the fear is about 
um, whether or not your representation will be authentic, whether or not you're using the right language, etc., cetera, um, are, are, are lessened in that capacity. But I fear that um, often with documentary, we are trying to raise awareness of difficult aspects of our society. So we're less likely to have documentaries about people who are successful and who are um, uh, living a, 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 a privileged life in some respect, um, who are, who are uh, uh, of uh, African descent, Afro-Caribbean descent. We're more likely to see um, characters who are oppressed, who are uh, facing into enormous challenges, which is of course very necessary and vital. And it's, you know, those filmmakers are trying to give the voiceless a voice, but I fear that it, it means that we end up again with those representations of um, the ethnic minority as uh, a, a secondary figure in society, as a subclass figure or a, a, a subjugated figure. Um, and that we just, we lack a diversity in terms of storytelling then. Um, uh, in terms of access to, for, for young filmmakers, I think absolutely documentary can be um, uh, a great, uh, you know, entry point um, into, the fil into the film industry. But there are so many more stories that can be told using that format. Um, and it would just be nice, I suppose, to, to see things expand a little bit. Um, to see um, more, uh, yeah, more diverse stories, more diverse characters, um, more diverse backgrounds represented on screen, yeah. um, as well as as bringing attention to to the very important stories that that um, uh, are, are about those facing enormous challenges in our society. Yeah, because it's not just a black white binary of course you know the black community is so complex and you know culturally so diverse within that community so yeah of course that does need to be represented uh, zelia i have a question um from alwyn daw um, she thanks you for your hugely insightful presentation you mentioned stereotypes and tropes in film several times and the role of funding agencies in terms of supporting work that contains these kinds of problematic and regressive narratives have you come across examples of models within agencies that successfully challenge these issues and help to achieve change in characterization? Well, I think as I, as I was saying that the British Film Institute's diversity standards has been making um, good inroads into uh, coming to terms with some of these problems. Um, so uh, that looks at, um, that requires uh, productions to look at meaningful representations of diversity on screen, uh, to look at uh, addressing diversity in terms of themes, in terms of narratives, in terms of place, um, as well as uh, make, uh, requiring productions to include diversity in, in, in the, the crew behind the work, um, and to try to uh, create new opportunities for employment in you know, under-resourced regions and so on. So I think that that has had a positive impact. Um, of course, as I mentioned, it only addresses uh, a limited number of films. It really needs to be, uh, it's being taken on by Film4 and, and BBC and obviously the British Film Institute. So the productions that gain their funding uh, are trying to come to terms with them, some of these issues often failing, but you know, they're only four years in. Um, it really needs to be taken on board across the industry to have any real impact. Um, and I think that one of the interesting things that they found was that uh, regardless of budget, the same problems exist. So there's often a perception that a production that has a, a much bigger budget um, will necessarily be more diverse but we're not seeing that represented in reality. Um, so I think there are some really strong recommendations uh, at the end of that report, which I would hope uh, uh, to see taken on board. Um, and I think that, you know, within our own industry, the changes to section 481, um, we're at the very early stages of that, but no doubt they will start to have some impact. 
And again, I think that, you know, a lot of this at the moment depends on a degree of goodwill as well. But we need people to, to as we're, I suppose, talking about at the moment in terms of Black Lives Matter, to be allies and to try and have those difficult conversations and try and address and reflect on their own practice. Um, because there's a certain amount that we can do in terms of requiring uh, individuals, requiring um, productions to take on board certain aspects of equality and diversity initiatives, but we actually need people to want to make those changes as well and to see those changes as, as beneficial. Otherwise, what we're doing is um, either going to fail or is not sustainable. So I think that, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that we can do in terms of funding bodies and le legislation and policy, but we also need, I think, a, a cultural attitudinal shift. Uh, Zelia, we have a question in from an anonymous attendee um, and they ask what films or filmmakers do you think are best navigating the tension between tragic mulattism and erasive colorblindness that is affirming racism without allowing it to define a racialized character and how are they doing it? I suppose that a hit list there of filmmakers whose work you admire are, you know, and I presume the, the questioner is interested in an international slate here, not just Irish. Um, they're, they're a huge number. I mean, it would be hard to, uh, to, to, to pick out one or two. Um, I think that there have been some really interesting films um, in terms of Irish film culture that have addressed migration and multiculturalism and identity without falling into the familiar territory. Um, for me, some of the recent films that, that have stood out would be uh, Bonnie Dempsey's work, which I referenced, uh, her short films, The Girl at the End of the Garden and um, All in Good Time. Um, Christine Malloy and Joe jo Lawler's Further Beyond. Um, and Mr. John, uh, which also stars Aidan Gillen, the, the Good Man. Um, I feel that those are some of the films which are trying to, um, of, I suppose, just present new and innovative methods of storytelling. And um, race and racism and racial themes are present, um, but so are many other complex elements of um, identity and narrative and so on. And I think that uh, that's what makes it interesting, that you're not getting stereotypical um, narratives and you're not getting familiar tropes, but you're also getting something experimental and, and challenging and thought provoking. Mm. Um, just a, a plug for ourselves, um, the Desperate Optimists Further Beyond is uh, now on IFI at Home, our new uh, uh, digital platform. So we, we've launched all of the films in the Real Art Collection, uh, which is an initiative of the Arts Council with the Dublin Film Festival. So Further Beyond is there and it certainly is a fascinating uh, investigation of national identity and, and race and so on. I'd, I'd recommend it too. Um, I... I, I wondered, uh, Zeli, um, if you had encountered any very, very problematic representations in your study of Irish cinema and what your position is on erasure of uh, archival, well, of suppressing of archival materials, which has been, um, oh, look, there she is, attention seeking for her publications. Do you want to show us the book, Zeli? Is that what you really wanted to? <laughs> These are that's Zaley's two wonderful books. We can we can plug them again at the end. But I just wondered uh, the, the kind of current debate on um, problematic representations and how archives should be dealing with those. Yeah, I mean, I've I've uh, written about a number of films uh, in in the book, um, which uh, I thought fairly recent films, which had very problematic representations. Um, I think that. When it comes to dealing with archives, um, I, I, on the whole, I would think that the media coverage, the print media, news media coverage has been somewhat sensationalist. Um, largely what 
the archives are doing is not erasing uh, or um, what archive bodies are doing is not erasing these works, but trying to present them with disclaimers or introductions, um, trying to put the works in context, trying to find the right way of doing that. And I think that's very important. Um, I don't think that we should erase these things, but I also am not sure that they need to be um, celebrated in the way that they have been. So films like um, The Birth of a Nation, films like Gone with the Wind, um, have often been viewed as classics without people taking on board the fact that these are deeply racially offensive on many levels and that the way that they present history is deeply revisionist. And I think that that's very important to have that context and to understand those works from that point of view. I think it's also interesting to learn more about the filmmakers um, that Griffith himself uh, allegedly um, had a long time uh, black partner, for example, and, um, and, and, and look at those relationships as well as the, the, the way that they chose to project a sort of um, white supremacist vision. Um, but I think that, you know, we've all grown up with a certain degree of erasure as well. When they show White Christmas uh, on uh, television, they don't show the blackface sequences. Um, there's so much that's already been edited out of our culture. So um, I think the current debates, I think they're important to have, but um, I worry that sometimes we start to lose track of what the focus should be, which is that there are um, films and, and uh, other aspects of our visual culture which have been designed to uphold a, an understanding of a racial hierarchy, which we have constructed and that we need to address that. And um, in, you know, we need to do that in whatever way we think works best. Um, and it, it, it doesn't happen. You don't address a racial hierarchy by pretending it doesn't exist. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, having these conversations, looking at the works again, and trying to put them in context is what's important, really. Great, thank you. Um, I think, Zeli, we may just have time for one more question. And I see Una Carney here who has bounced her question from the chat room into the Q&A room where it should have been in the first place, Una. <laughs> uh, Una asks, there's a real problem with diversity in writing in UK TV and film. Lots of diversity schemes run by the BBC, but not enough change in hiring writers. If writers ultimately tell our stories, how to make the commissioners more aware and accountable? Any thoughts? Una's feeling is that it's the commissioners within our institutions who need training in gender and diversity politics, not just us, the makers. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's something that we, a lot of, um, you know, people are talking about as well, that the gatekeepers are the ones who really need to shift. It's all very well for people to be out on the streets uh, protesting and buying um, Rennie, Edo Lodge, Rennie Edo Lodge's book and so on. If we're in, a, in, in an echo chamber preaching to ourselves, um, and yet the people who actually make the decisions remain uh, the same group and uh, don't shift their, uh, their way of thinking, their way of working, their way of hiring, don't expand their networks, don't start to read those books, don't take on diversity training, um, nothing changes. Uh, we have, you know, I, I would come back to when Black Panther came out and there was so much excitement and um, people said that it was a, a sea change, you know, that things will never be the same again. We've proven that a black film can make money. And yet we've been there before. Um, th there have been these moments throughout history where black films have become very popular or where people have started to address racism in the mainstream. And it tends to be a short lived trend. So, and, and the reason for that is because the people at the top are not um, having to undergo the same work that the rest of us are. So I think that it's it's crucial that um, we expect more of our, our public bodies in particular, our national broadcasters, our funding agencies, uh, and so on, to ensure that they start to think about who is, who is 
making the decisions and what understanding they have of diversity and inclusion policy and how it can actually benefit their organization. Thank you. I said Una's was the last question, but there are, there are one or two more. Uh, a quick one from Pat Riley um, about the role of promotion in getting diverse films noticed. Um, so do you have any thoughts about that, Celia, about distribution and, and uh, distribution of black made and, and black representation films in cinemas and TV and so on? Well, simply to say that in the past, there has been a problem with getting distribution for those films, um, just as with uh, LGBTQ focused filmmaking, um, the, these, these works are often ghettoized. So the, the very notion that, we're, that they're often classified as, as black films rather than as films or as dramas, um, the, uh, the way that they are, uh, I suppose that the perceived audience that they have has often meant that they're targeted at specific audiences um, rather than general audiences, and that they often are not uh, or fail to gain international distribution. We're talking about Irish or British films. Um, I think that that is again starting to shift, and I think organisations like Netflix have been quite useful in that respect. Um, I'm thinking of, say, Belle, uh, a British period drama made by a, a black female director, which um, does take race as a, as a primary element of its drama, um, but is also a period drama about a mixed race uh, English aristocrat based on a historical character. And through Netflix, that's been able to reach an enormous audience, which I'm not sure it would have um, within England or within Britain, given that period dramas are often seen as, uh, well, as white spaces and that a film about a mixed race or a protagonist um, would be seen as a, as a film that, you know, falls into the slavery uh, ghetto or the, the, the black film ghetto and, and wouldn't be seen as, as a, of interest to general audiences. So I think that streaming services and, and um, other organizations are helping to shift that a little bit um, to broaden those audiences. But I think, again, it comes down to who is deciding that these films are only relevant to small groups? Um, who is deciding that because they have one theme, that theme uh, therefore dominates the entire uh, you know, production? There are lots of other things going on in Bell apart from uh, the racial aspect. Um, so I think that it, it, it does come down to the people who are running the publicity departments and, and so on. I, I think that, you know, every cultural institution in the country, in the world, you know, has, has had time to take stock of our agendas over the past number of months. And, and certainly in the IFI, we will be looking at programming. Uh, we will be looking to dig deeper into our presentations on diversity, whether it's in our main program or in our schools program. And, you know, in some respects, it's in response to Black Lives Matter, but it's also, you know, that we feel we're part of a continuing conversation with you and others um, on, you know, representation of, of marginal voices, um, conversations about diversity and so on. So we look forward to kind of continuing that conversation with you. Um, I have one last question from Susan Liddy. Um, I, who asks, have you any more books or articles in the pipeline, Zaley? I know you've been busy with other productions in recent months, um, who have been mercifully quiet in the background. So, yes. um, and congratulations on that production. But uh, any, any books in the pipeline that we should look out for? Um, not at present. Uh, as you mentioned, I, I gave birth recently, so um, that's been my main focus. I was working on a piece on two pieces, uh, looking at history, memory and commemoration in terms of slavery and colonialism and how uh, that manifests itself in, in French cinema, recent French cinema uh, in particular, and in uh, uh, recent American cinema, specifically horror films and experimental films uh, made by black directors. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at I, I was looking at those issues and then um, uh, this moment happened 
spurred by uh, a, a, another terrible um, killing of an innocent person. But we've seen this huge movement, which is bringing to light this, these issues of how we commemorate, who we commemorate, um, what is remembered and how we, uh, I suppose, explore our histories through storytelling on screen. Um, and it's interesting to see how with the, with the emergence of black directors into more um, genres, particularly in American cinema, but also in French cinema, um, we're starting to see the ability to tell those stories and communicate, articulate histories that have been unarticulated. So um, to gain new understandings of kind of national identity and, and uh, national heroes from other perspectives um, so that's that's uh, work that I'm I'm focused on right now. That's, yeah. Great. Well, Zeli, thank you so much. It's always a, a pleasure and an education uh, to listen to you. Um, it's 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 so great that you're paying attention to all this um, and, and then sharing your your findings with us. Um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Um, and we will keep ye all posted on our next spotlight. We just haven't quite tied down the date yet, but uh, I'm sure, uh, as I can see from the comments and the chat, that um, we've all had a really uh, productive and illuminating hour. So thank you very much indeed, Zeli, and good luck with, with the babies. Thank you, Suneva. <laughs> Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye.